We're continuing with our discussion of the Lacanian unconscious. And where we left off the last time, we made this kind of problematizing uh, statement in our best Lacan imitation maxim. The unconscious does not exist. One other element, one other facet of that pretend proclamation would be just to also point to the obvious fact that the unconscious doesn't exist as a positive entity. It's rather the distortions, the gaps, the unfinished elements, the things that cannot be accounted for. Which, of course, is yet again another way of, of, of revisiting and thinking about the Lacanian idea that the status of the unconscious is ethical rather than, than, than ontological. That being noted, let us now make an important contribution to this whole debate. One of the areas in which, one of the ways in which the Lacanian approach to the unconscious seems very different to some aspects of a Freudian account is that for Lacan the unconscious is squarely within the domain of the symbolic. Now we've spent a lot of time talking about the various symbolic operations that make the unconscious work that enable it to operate. So that shouldn't necessarily come as a surprise but for many of us we have this idea that the unconscious is pre-verbal, that it's full of images, that it's full of uh, it's pre-linguistic. So this move is an audacious one to suggest that the unconscious is squarely within the domain of the symbolic that the unconscious is filled with signifiers, or not filled with signifiers, but operates through signifiers. This, for many Freudians, sounds somewhat odd. What I want to focus on today is an idea that I've often found students find rather uh, counterintuitive. And that is that if we are going to be thinking about the unconscious within the domain of language, within the domain of the symbolic, within the domain of the signifier, and bear in mind, Lacan sometimes just uses that phrase, the signifier, to refer to the whole symbolic, the whole domain of symbolic linguistic operations generally. If we are going to think the unconscious in that domain, this is kind of a paradigm shift from some moments in Freud. But part of what it also needs us to focus on, this is the counterintuitive idea, is that agency might be located within the symbolic rather than simply within the ego. The reason I say this is a counterintuitive idea is often with students, uh, particularly in undergrad classes, I'll say, well, let's think about agency today. Let's think about what is agentic, what makes things happen. Uh, let's give some ideas. Let's think about this. And without fail, we'll have 10, 15, 20 examples, ideas of what agency is. But it's all squarely within the domain of subjectivity. Or, to be more precise, it tends to be the ego agency. Or, for lack of, I suppose, that would be the kind of image of ego agency. The shift one needs to make in grasping what phenomenon, sorry, Lacan, don't know what that's about, you can work it out yourself. Actually, I do know there's a Fanon reference coming, but nevertheless, what Lacan is talking about with symbolic agency is that words speak through us, that the symbolic domain of words, signifiers, language is itself agentic. Now let's try and underline that in a couple of ways to try and animate this idea, make it worthwhile. And I'm doing a little bit of a, a shout out here to my uh, colleague Callum Matheson, who's got a great chapter in this book. This is a book that um, I've co-edited along with Callum Neal and Stan Van Hola. It's called, it's one of a series of reading Lacan's decree. And Callum Matheson's chapter is all about, uh, and a, a very nice reading of Lacan's famous uh, paper, called the instance of the letter. Now, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning that is because there are multiple different interpretations of that paper. Sometimes it's been translated as the agency of the letter. The Bruce Fink version of that translation in this version of Lacan's decree is entitled instance of the letter. Now, initially I thought, oh, we've lost agency. Instance isn't quite as good, but as Callum Matheson points out, and as Bruce Fink is obviously aware, Lacan wants to emphasize in talking about the instant or the instance of the letter, that language itself brings with it a certain insistence, a certain urgent force, a kind of activity, almost a kind of intervention. So whether we're thinking of agency or insistence or a kind of intervention, that's the theme for today. How does language itself involve a kind of agency? Now, we can, we can think about that in a number of ways. But just to reiterate the obvious point here, 
when we're talking about symbolic agency, the agency of the symbolic, the agency of language, what we're also saying is that the agency of the ego, the pretend belief that I'm in control of lots of parts of my life, maybe there's some legitimacy in that. It tends to mean that we don't focus on how the symbolic as such has a determining influence on us. Or, put in the more dramatic terms that like I'll never tires of repeating, that the signifier has a determining influence. The signifier determines the, the subject. Now, again, that sounds a little bit difficult. It sounds a little bit intimidating. Sounds a little bit problematic. But the idea here is, if we're taking this stuff seriously, if we want to be analysts, we want to think about how psychoanalysis is useful in thinking about culture, how is it that the symbolic, both at the level of the words, the sentences, the utterances that we deploy, and that are, as it were, deployed through us, and more culturally, how is it that language has an agency? An agency which typically and often overdetermines our own sense of our subjective agency. Well, we can make a number of arguments. One is to say that, very basically, <clears throat> There's a diachronic dimension to language. Differently put, language, as I speak it, as I read it, unfolds over time. So if someone says to me, makes a bad kind of joke, a horse walked into a bar. It was a steel bar. There is a, a kind of suspension effect, and you can find this in virtually any sentence, where the grammatical structure of the sentence is there. As it unfolds, I'm already trying to anticipate what the end of the sentence will be. So part of what makes jokes work is you, and then as the sentence starts to unfold, you find that there's a different meaning, right? So in the process of anyone communicating, anyone sharing a basic sentence, we're going to find that the sentence is unfolding. The sentence is, and we are typically anticipating where that sentence is going to go. So already in that potential unfolding, there is a momentum of language. It, it's, 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 we might be anticipating it, but that's part of the grammatical unfolding of sentences itself. For me, a nice example of that is predictive texts. I don't know if iPhones today do that. Certainly uh, cell phones of a certain era did that. And you'd have this thing, you're sending out a text to someone to say, I would really like to, do you want to go meet after a football game or something? And as you're doing it, the phone is and like the text is already giving you suggestions for what your sentence might be. It's a lovely example of how language itself has a momentum and starts to speak something beyond what you may have been wanting to say. So in addition to the diachronic aspect of language, this fact that it keeps us waiting for what the end of the sentence will be, we also have the fact that Lacan's always talking about signifiers. He's always talking about signifiers because he's taking an awful lot from structural linguistics. And what structural linguistics wants to say is that there are no natural inherent meanings to words. There's no universal bond between cat, 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 that word that I keep on repeating, and the feline creature. There's a, a conventionalized relationship between those things. But as we know from different languages, you can call that thing an, an awful lot of different types of things. So what that also then means is if there's no universal true bond between a given utterance, a given signifier and that thing, that signifier only takes on its value, its function, by reference to other signifiers. And of course, you can give the elementary example. When you don't know what a word means, you look up in a dictionary. So you try to ascertain the meaning of a word. How? By looking at other words. So this idea that words are always referring to other words is another way in which there is momentum within the field of signifiers. This is also why I like going back to the predictive text thing, this idea that language is a kind of moving system, that it's always giving us more possibilities for what the sentence might be or how we should understand the sentence. Interestingly then, there is a turn of phrase that Lacan starts to adopt around about the mid-1950s. He starts talking about the signifying chain. I can't tell you how many times I bash my head against the toilet bowl trying to, what's he talking about with the signifying chain? But one or two implications of that are ones we've already drawn out. If you have a chain of signifiers, you can always add to it, right? It's always additive. It's always looking for extensions, you could say. And the other is, it's like the predictive text, which when there is, as it were, a train or momentum of grammar in place, it kind of is starting to give you other suggestions. In a way, you could say it's starting to think beyond you. So 
we've got those two small little ideas of where we see a kind of insistence or momentum of signifiers. And we see that in the operation of a very basic sentence. So here's a little example that I came up with just to try and, and illustrate something of this. Here's a basic sentence. Donald, in times of illness, caught. Now what I'm referring to here is a very nice example that Bruce Fink introduces in his commentary on Instance of the Letter. He uses a different one, but I suppose what he's trying to do is, if you imagine me saying this in slow motion, Donald, in times of illness, caught. You could say that as that sentence plays out in slow motion, the way you perceive it is you're already, oh, Donald. Duck? Maybe, maybe this guy's telling me a sentence about Donald Duck. Oh, oh, no, hold on. Given our political era, maybe he's talking about this guy, Trump. Now, as you make that connection, or even, it doesn't matter if you make the connection. I suppose it does make... Anyways, as that word, that signifier, is put into play, your field of receptivity, your understanding of how that word is usually used, and the associations that usually go with it, are, as it were, already alit are already in place so you can understand and grapple with where the sentence is going. And what I like about this kind of depiction of the sentence is you can start to see how the sentence is already being read at more than one level. There's more than one associative uh, stream that comes out of the sentence. Again, you could say this is one way of thinking about how jokes work. Donald Duck, oh, Donald Trump. Both of those meanings I'm holding in place. I'm a big Donald Duck fan, if you hadn't noticed. Um, both of those meanings are held in place, and then I see or listen to the sentence in times of illness. And already, okay, times of illness. I mean, if I was more creative, I might have used a nice Dickensian idiom or phrase here. But in times of illness, okay, in times, is he talking about the coronavirus era? In time, yeah, probably that seems to be applicable. But these are ill times. Maybe I should have said sick times. There's awful political events happening around us. So do I hear it as, in times of illness, a Dickensian idiom? Do I hear it in times of uh, COVID-19? Do I hear it in terms of uh, the sickness of our era? Court. And of course, you can see I've deliberately picked a word that has got more than one meaning. Court. What? The coronavirus? Donald, in times of illness, caught an illness. That seems to be where the sentence is taking you. But of course, knowing the multiple different tributaries, the different streams of how I'm able to hear that sentence and how I might also be caught unexpected, you could say uh, caught a fish or caught a slap in the face or caught a lucky break. So in that moment you've got a whole series of proliferating possibilities for how that sentence might be heard and that anticipation of meaning comes with the structure of grammar being there itself so this is just a very brief sketch of how language brings with it alternative possible meanings and for those of you who've uh, already listened to the lecture i gave on uh, bill clinton's i did not have sexual relations with that woman will start to get a similar sense of how I've tried to explain something about an external unconscious, an unconscious enabled by linguistic processes, an unconscious where there's multiple different meanings, different associative trains made possible simply by the fact of grammar. So that is one way of starting to think about the agency of the signifier of language speaking beyond us. There's another very important way, and my earlier Freudian slip, and I said Fanon instead of Lacan, is instructive here because Another way of thinking about this agency that comes with the signifying chain of language itself comes with the notion of symbolic efficacy. Sometimes it's referred to as symbolic efficacity, and it's a concept that Lacan pretty much borrows or steals, depending on your, on your position on Lacan, from Levi-Strauss. The idea with symbolic efficacy, symbolic efficacy, is that when certain signifiers start to be utilized within culture, they start to, as it were, take on a life of their own. So a nice example of that is myths. You don't have to believe myths 
Myths are propounded. Myths are spoken. They're repeated. They're in the history of a culture. They keep on coming back. I mean, it, I'm thinking also a little bit, even without the, the capital M for myth, you know, the whole, the whole palaver of Christmas in the Western world. And you know, you've got all these things, there's trees, there's this guy in a, in a red suit, uh, all of these different things happening. It, and it starts to, as it were, take on a life of its own, so much so that one can have very few people who, as it were, subjectively in their ego love or believe in Christmas. Presumably there are still a whole bunch of them. But you can also have this kind of ironic detachment from Christmas, which doesn't in any way stop Christmas from happening. There's something of a symbolic efficacity here of a myth or of a series of cultural beliefs that carry on despite that I don't necessarily have to believe in them. Despite even that I may take, um, I may congratulate myself in being so cynically detached from Christmas, despite that that believing goes on within a culture. And of course, when Slavoj Žižek takes on some of these ideas, he, you can see how he would consider this a nice way of thinking about ideology. I myself don't need to believe in an ideology for that ideology to be persistent. And I can make attributions to the other. The other believes. I don't believe. Whilst that overall structure of belief continues. So this is my five cents contribution to that theorization. You could then say, and I think this is a nice way of thinking about symbolic efficacy, as uh, symbols, signifiers, taking on a meaning and, and being persistent and taking on an agency above and beyond that of individual psychological subjects of egos, you could say there is a structure of believing that continues even though you don't believe in it, or you don't subjectively in your ego have to believe in something to be part of a structure of believing. And if you're wondering where the Fanon reference is, I think Fanon kind of understands this. Franz Fanon, the anti-colonial theorist who makes use of psychoanalysis, has a nice phrase when he's talking about the colonial domain. And he says the, colon the colonist, the colonialist, is always an exhibitionist. This is a characteristic move of Fanon. He's using some kind of uh, psychoanalytic language without necessarily being fully psychoanalytic about it. But what I think is so apt about his characterization there is that he's trying to suggest, he's succeeding in suggesting, that in the colonial domain, race is, and, and separations of race and racial difference are apparent all the time. It's almost like it needs to be paraded, it needs to be exhibited, it needs to be reenacted. Uh, black people will sit here, white people will sit there. This is the neighborhood for white people, this is the place for black people. Every facet of everyday existence seems to re-signify racial difference. And again, why do I mention that? I mention that, and we've kind of moved away from the clinical domain of Lacanian psychoanalysis to a more cultural, political, sociological application of some of these ideas, is that for racism to thrive in a given society, it can thrive at a structural level, despite that individuals may not be believing racist subjects. In other words, they themselves might be caught in that situation of, I don't myself personally need to believe in a racist idea for there to be a structure of which I am part. Or put that again, I don't personally need to be a believer at a personal psychological egoic level for there to be a structure of belief within my society, within my neighborhood, within the structural ar arrangements of my university that I am nonetheless a part of.